So the problem I want to uh, address here is uh, so in, uh, in CL, since 10 years or maybe 20 years, uh, machine learning uh, has a very central role. And uh, so empirical CL basically uh, can be defined as an application of machine learning to natural language problems. So we define uh, our problems in terms of uh, machine learning problems. And then we want to use machine learning tools to solve the problem. So we basically press uh, our natural language problem into a classification, regression, ranking, uh, something else problem. And we, we use the tools that are built for those tasks to solve the problem. So uh, machine learning assumes that uh, if you want to use those tools, if you want to solve those problems, that you are given a uh, representation of instances. So the instances are known as vectors. So all, all you know, your world consists of a vector representation of instances, right? And an association of instances and labels. But in computational linguistics, that's not always true. So it's not always true that you are start that you can start with a feature representation of instances. You will you will create your features manually. It's not like in uh, in vision where you where the pixels are naturally given images, uh, naturally given features, and you are not always given instances and labels, right? So people sit down and annotate the data by hand. So that's a bit that's that's an important difference. And so my question is, can we really do what people like uh, Kevin Corp suggest, namely take machine learning as philosophy of science for computational linguistics? And I would say, well, there are you have to be careful if you want to do that because uh, of this manual data annotation issue. So now uh, I, I really want to go even deeper into something that uh, you might think is not uh, stuff you have to care about here at KIT, at uh, the Technical University, philosophy of science, but just uh, stay with me. <laughs> okay, uh, the idea is uh, I want to understand or basically use uh, the terminology from the philosophers to understand this manual data and feature construction problem. So that's uh, what I described in this uh, computational linguistics paper. So and, and, and what I start from is uh, uh, philosophy of science is actually founded by a physicist, Joseph D. Sneed, and, and he made a distinction between theoretical and non-theoretical terms in response to what people in, uh, in the empiricist tradition called uh, observational terms and theoretical terms. So in, in his framework, there is no observation terms and theoretical terms. It's always, all terms are theoretical with respect to a particular theory. So you have a, th a theory and uh, terms are theoretical with respect to that theory or non-theoretical with respect to that theory. So you always start from th this relativistic point of view. And uh, by the theoretical terms, it's easier to understand it if you talk about theoretical quantities or functions. And what you have to do is you have to measure these quantities or functions. Okay, so let's look at a simple example of a theory. So that's uh, a simple theory of Archimedean statics. So the theory consists in a set theoretic notation of a tuple of uh, objects A1 to AN, then two uh, functions D and G, one, to, uh, one uh, denotes distance, the other weight, and uh, a central axiom, that's number six, and the central axiom can be understood if you uh, view it as uh, a, a pivot point and objects uh, that have a certain distance and a weight from the, uh, from the pivot point. So uh, the, the central axiom tells you that uh, the product, sum of products 
of the distance and weight has to be the same for the objects on either side of the pivot point. Yeah? Okay, so if, if we now uh, want to understand what empirical statements are, yeah, then an empirical statement is a statement that a certain entity is a model of the theory. And a model of the theory is, a, is, is something that satisfies one through six. Yeah? So the most important thing is six, the central axiom. So for example, if we want to know if what we see here is a model of the theory, if it is this an Archimedean static, so these children and this balanced, it's not balanced here, I didn't find a picture of a balanced seesaw, but it's these children that you can imagine if they are in balance, is this a model of the theory? So can we make an empirical statement, why is an AS? So in, in order to make the statement, we have to measure distance and uh, weight of the children. And um, if we assume now that to in order to measure distance and weight, all we have is uh, beam balance scales. You see, that's, there's the bananas and there's the weight. And the, the guy can move the weight left to right. And, and, and uh, once the, uh, uh, the beam balance is in balance, then he knows what the weight of the bananas are. So if we, if we assume that we have, uh, the only measuring procedure for weight is beam balance scale. And for distance, we have a measuring tape. Then, uh, the problem is that the validity of our measuring results, if we measure the weight of the children, depends on a statement that Z, which is the entity consisting of the beam balance scale, the child and the counterbalancing measuring weight, if we have a child instead of bananas hanging on this beam balance scale, <laughs> Then, uh, so you see, we, we have uh, a circularity problem. In order to measure the weight of the children, we have to presuppose successful applications of the theory. And in order to decide for successful application, we have to measure the weight. So it's uh, circular, so it, it's not an empirical statement. So that's the argumentation from the philosophers of, of science. So that there are complex physical theories, or theories in physics, uh, where you uh, where you can't get around this problem, and and and, and so and, and they they have a, a, a very complex, uh, different ways to solve the problem. But the, the simplest and standard solution actually is, for example, for this uh, Archimedean statics, you just use another procedure to measure namely a procedure that is not AS-theoretic, an AS non-theoretic measurement procedure, like spring scales, then you don't have the circularity problem. You don't have to assume the validity of the theory that you uh, want to measure weights to make an empirical statement that something is a model. So that's the general solution. If uh, in to measure values of C T theoretical functions, you should use T non theoretical measuring theories. So, the, the lesson from the philosophers of, of science is so, I'm not talking now about these complex physical theories where, you, where there are some other solutions that you need, but the standard solution is you have to make a distinction between your T theoretical and T non theoretical terms, right? So now that, that we have this machinery, these tools in, in, in our hands, we can try to go back to computational linguistics and see how we can use this uh, T-theoretical, T-non-theoretical uh, notations to understand why and how uh, circularities can appear in computational linguistics. So for example, if we formulate uh, computational linguistics as structure prediction, it's a, it's a very, I know there are other approaches, but let's, let's say structural prediction is the framework that we use. So what we have is we have a, a prediction function that uh, is parameterized by a weight vector, a d-dimensional weight vector, and a feature vector on labels and inputs, and some uh, some function that measures the compatibility of pairs X and Y, like a linear model or a nonlinear model, and, and so on. 
So then the circularity problem would occur if there is only one theory, one theoretical tier used in data annotation and in feature design. So it, it's always X and Y you have to combine. And if you use one on and only one theory to uh, assign Ys to the Xs and uh, associate Xs and Ys via features, then you have then you can say uh, I'm running into the same circularity problem as before in the Archimedean statics example, as the, the problem that the philosophers of science have pointed out. So let's look at an example. So I've been working on patent translation and patent uh, retrieval for a while. And uh, what you do in that area is uh, you use citations of patents in other patents to create automatic relevance judgments. So you can create large amounts of training data, uh, queries and relevant doc and documents by citation. So you can assume that uh, if a patent lawyer cites another patent, then this must be relevant. And pa patents that are not cited might be not relevant. So now if you want to do a learning to rank approach for patent information retrieval, then you can use features like same IPC class or same inventor or features on TF-IDF match or some other similarity matter, uh, metrics as features and train on this relevance data, train and evaluate. So now somebody could come along and say, I have a really good idea for a feature. Why don't we uh <coughs> use uh, the citations as features in our model? Then you can see uh, that, that, that's, that this, this won't work. It's, 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 it's this classical circularity problem. You, can't, you can either use IPC classes to annotate the data and use the citations as features, or use the citations to annotate the data and the IPC classes as features. But you can't have the same. Uh, because all you're learning, if you, if, you, if you use the citations as features and to annotate your data, is uh, you, you will put all the weight on this one feature and you will model the, the training data perfectly, but there is no empirical statement. There is no, there is no, you, you didn't learn any, you, you don't go beyond uh, your closed world of uh, automatic uh, annotation of training data and automatic construction of features. So another example in uh, semantics, so if you want to learn semantic relations, uh, including presupposition and entailment, then there are standard linguistic tests like the negation test that allows you to make a different uh, differentiation. So the one uh, presupposition is preserved under negation, the other entailment is not. So and uh, you would uh, run into the same problems of circularity in that uh, case if you would tell your annotators, use the negation tests in, uh, to, to annotate your data to make the distinction between entailment and presupposition, like if it's a binary classification task, and create a feature that automatically detects uh, negation and then uh, you train a classifier that learns to distinguish presupposition from entailment. And another example, Manual data annotation, so that's, uh, that's maybe the most uh, critical example because uh, some people might feel I'm stepping on their toes because uh, many uh, people uh, believe that the right way to annotate data, the right way to get good inter-annotator agreement is to have experts and to have the experts discuss the annotations, basically if you see that they don't agree very well, that they uh, have to decide on, 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 on a case-by-case on, on, on case basis for a particular annotation, then uh, other people have criticized this as uh, that experts that do annotation or coding, it's called here, they might agree because they are carefully now, because they are long-term collaborators and they know the purpose of the research very well, and they, they don't agree because uh, they follow some written instruction or, or, or because they really uh, 
are talking about uh, that they, they are making empirical independent statements. And I would say in addition to uh, this, uh, this problem that you might get high inter-annotator agreement uh, that is meaningless because they only agree because they know each other and so well and they know the tasks well, you also have this circularity problem. Or it c could be that you have this circularity problem for the same reasons. Because there is, there is no distinction between a theory that talks about the data and a, th and a theory that talks about uh, your model. So it, it's all implicit, tacit knowledge that is used in, 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 in both ways. Okay, so how can we uh, get around this problem? So the, ph the philosophers of science, they have very uh, vague uh, solutions. They th one, one solution is that uh, they recommend that the possibility to use T non-theoretical strategies to identify observations, that should be uh, the defining criterion for empirical science. So if you, if you want to claim that what you're doing is empirical science, then you have to have uh, at least the possibility to identify your, your data and your objects in another theory. And, and they say, okay, wh what does it mean, T non-theoretical? So you need an, an acknowledged method for determination of a term in another theory and a link from that other theory to your theory. So in this uh, Archimedean statics example, it would be the spring scale, right? It's the spring scale, it's another theory. There must be uh, some theory in physics that describes how spring scales work. And if you can use uh, weight measurements using spring scales, uh, spring scales to uh, make empirical statements in other theories, then you can maybe use it as well in your Archimedean statics theory. That would be an example. But for computational linguistics, it, that's a little bit too uh, vague. Yeah? So and and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm now presenting three ways to get around this problem in computational linguistics. So one is crowdsourcing or using naive coders. So I mean, uh, that's not new. Crowdsourcing has been used before. And, uh, but the main reason why crowdsourcing has been used is uh, because it's cheap and you get uh, good results if you, if you know how to uh, figure out uh, disagreements and, 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 and throw away bad judgments and, and, and so on. But uh, one, one point that has not really been uh, stressed so far in, in, in crowdsourcing is that if you are required to uh, formulate your data annotation task in a language that is not the language of your theory, if, if you're not allowed to use technical terms, if you, if, if you can't just use your linguistic theory for data annotations and, and, and throw them to your students or, or to, your, to, your, to your colleagues and, and tell them, just go and, 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 and do the annotation. If you are forced to break down the problem into simpler problems, formulate it into simpler terms, then you will have automatically you will have another layer. You, you have a, another theory. You, you have this distinction between your theory and your non-T theory. Another uh, solution uh, that I like especially is grounding in extrinsic tasks. So uh, what that means is uh, people have uh, used that so far mainly for uh, evaluation. So for example, uh, Miyao Yusuke, he uh, evaluated parsers that have been trained and evaluated on the Wall Street Journal, Penn Tree Bank. And uh, have been th there has been a ranking that has been standing for a long time. Uh, some parsers are considered the best on the Penn Tree Bank. Then he used those parsers to do ma uh, information retrieval on uh, biomedical data on the Genia corpus. And he found a totally different ranking of the parser. So an extrinsic task might give you uh, a, a completely different uh, information or quality of the parsers. And uh, grounded language learning means that you don't do that just for, uh, for evaluation, but you do it for learning. 
And uh, I, will, I will get back to that when I talk about the, uh, the MT work. So it's basically the idea is that you have an extrinsic signal that you can, uh, if you simplify it to a binary signal, that you can use uh, to uh, for uh, a surrogate labels for, uh, for training, positive or negative examples. And that's also a way of grounding because you, uh, you, you have no influence on the extrinsic task. So it's something that is, that is in independent of your theory, of your wishes, yeah? Okay, then uh, one argument might be, okay, for machine translation, we don't have to care about all of that because what we do in machine translation is we use data in the wild. So there was this nice paper by uh, Fernando Pereira was in the paper and uh, Halevi and other people at, at Google where they said that uh, the biggest successes in NLP, relate, also in natural language related machine learning are SMT and ASR. And the main reason is because there are data available in the wild. So that means the input output behavior that we seek to automate is available in the wild. So it's in large quantities and it's exactly what we need. It's not, it's not done by, by annotators who are paid to do the task. It's, it, it's done in, in a natural setting. And if you have, if you're lucky and you have such data, then you can also assume that you are working in a, in a empirical setting. So you have, a, you, you, it's clear that you have a distinction between the construction of the data, which is done in the wild. It's not something that you can influence and the theory you build on those data. Okay. So now uh, grounded learning for machine translation. So uh, as I said, uh, in principle, SMT is uh, grounded by data in the wild. So people have done manual data annotation for evaluation and some for, uh, for training, crowdsourcing. But uh, I don't know of a lot of work where SMT has been grounded in extrinsic tasks. And one of the things I'm... So what I have seen is... Uh, extrinsic tasks for evaluation, like reading comprehension tests have been used for evaluation for a long time. Then uh, computer-assisted translation uses user feedback, but it's, it's somehow not really extrinsic, right? Because it's m most of the time user feedback comes from translators who are paid to uh, correct the translation. So the task is, well, <laughs> in a very abstract setting, correct the translation, make it a good translation. Uh, they, they, the professional translators don't really care what the translation is. There's, there's no extrinsic uh, task that they have to fulfill with the translation. They don't have to go and buy something or find the train station with this translation or something like that. So and what I've been working on is uh, grounding SMT in a retrieval task to improve cross-language information retrieval. And what is done, uh, so cross-language information retrieval, what the ultimate goal is high retrieval performance. So the goal is not a good translation. The translation is just a means to an end. And that's how it's done. The state of the art in uh, CLR is exactly like that. Translation is a means to an end. You first do the translation and then you do the IR. And uh, those things are keep separate. And m the idea is that we, you want to optimize the translation component for the, for the ranking task. Or you don't care if the translation looks nice to a human. I, I, you, r you really want to optimize the retrieval performance. or so you want to ground translation in the task. And there are many possible ways to do that. So that uh, the standard approach that is uh, built in in the Google cross language information retrieval system is you use uh, the Google SMT system and uh, you train mostly the language model on, uh, on queries. So we have a, uh, a query large data, lo query log data, and you train a language model that now knows better how queries look like. And uh, you do SMT and then you do IR. It's completely separate. Then uh, in, in research, the, uh, 
the best model at the moment. Uh, it's also a translation approach, but in difference to the standard uh, direct translation approach, uh, I I you're not just doing, uh, you you're not taking the best translation only, but you are taking uh, n best translations and you're extracting terms that you that you use in the target language from a l from an n best list of translations. So you basically do implicit query expansion by not just taking one translation, but translation alternatives. And the translation alternatives you take are ones that you get from the n-best list. So it's not from the, from the full translation table, but only from the translations that are in the n-best translations for your query. So there is some, some uh, disambiguation done and some query uh, expansion done in these models. So the advantages uh, of uh, optimizing direct translation for CLIR is, well, you can uh, keep those two things separate, which is uh, sometimes nice. But uh, the tuning uh, you can do is it's, it's, it's very little. Uh, you can mostly just tune the language model. And, 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 and it's clear that if you, if you do full translations of the queries, you are on the one side doing too much because word ordering is not an issue at all. For for the for, for the retrieval, <laughs> and you're not doing enough because you are agnostic of the retrieval task. So then, a uh, uh, first approach I found uh, on uh, going further in this direction of optimizing translation for uh, retrieval has been done by uh, Christoph Mons and his students. And uh, what they do is they uh, take an n-best list and reorder the n-best list according to uh, the, per the retrieval performance of each of the translations of the queries. And then they do a re-ranking with uh, uh, nice features and uh, train an external ranker on this map ordered list and they get uh, some small improvements. So it's basically, it's. Uh they get some improvements, but it's uh, very indirect because the decoder doesn't know anything about uh, your new features and the weights. It's just a re-ranking. You, you, you have to end best list. Once you, you, you reorder re the end best list according to map performance, then you train on it and you use that uh, f uh, in the next step. But you, 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 you can't inform the decoder. And it's costly because you have to do a retrieval step uh, for each translation. So in order to uh, do this reordering of the, tr of the MBEST list, you, have a do a, uh, you, you need an, a MAP score, an NDCG score for each of the translated queries. So what my two of my students are working on at the moment is they don't, it's a very similar approach, but they are doing ranking. So they, uh, the decoder knows about the features that you use on this reordered uh, MBEST list. And uh, they are not doing a retrieval for each query, but they have uh, found a way of uh, I once uh, basically uh, in similar to blue oracle decoding, they have a map oracle decoding that defined in the in the hypergraph the translation that uh, works best for the retrieval task. So by uh, yeah decomposing uh, th uh, the metric, so it's uh, an NDCG type metric, decomposing the metric, they, they, they can find the shortest path in the hypergraph that gives them the oracle, and then they can use this oracle to retrain, so to uh, basically uh, best versus rest for our ranking, so they don't have to do a retrieval step in each for each translation. So it's uh, more direct because it's ranking instead of re-ranking, it's less costly, but unfortunately it doesn't work yet. So we, <laughs> we have to do more tuning. So it, it, it's in principle, it, 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 it must work. We just, yeah, we are not there yet. Okay, then uh, another uh, work uh, we have done that works is, uh, so this is basically, so it's even more radical so if, if the goal is uh, good retrieval performance and you, you want to do it cross-lingually, then why not just uh, throw away the SMT system and just use the ideas of SMT? So basically, from uh, data that are 
queries and relevant documents learn a phrase table and use that because uh, word ordering is not really the most relevant thing. The phrases are important. Learn a phrase table from relevance rankings. So the idea is, so it's a, it's a direct ranking approach. So we have queries and documents, and the idea is we want to have a scoring function on query documents. So queries is, uh, in our case, it's patent. So query is a patent and document is a patent. So we want, and, and we train on patent data where we use these uh, uh, citations as relevance links. And the, the idea is each word or each bigram in the query and in the document is uh, so we have a quadratic expansion of the words and the bigrams, and we have a huge matrix of features. And so we want to learn a, a weight matrix that uh, basically gives a weight to each uh, word, word, or bigram, unigram, unigram, bigram, bigram, bigram pair. And we learn that directly on the ranking data because the goal is ranking and the most important information we have are the words. So you can see if you uh, reformulate uh, this problem, then you can get a standard linear form. So it's, it's very easy. So we, the, the feature vector is constructed basically by, by flattening the matrix. So it's uh, I'm, also the i minus one times d plus j entry is the, uh, the, the entry of the outer product of Q times D. So you just flatten the matrix and, and have a large, large feature vector. And you learn, and, and that means you can use all standard linear models to uh, approach the problem. And what we did is uh, we did pairwise ranking on relevant and non-relevant documents. So pairwise ranking is nice if you have more than one relevant document, I and mean we had uh, 15 on average relevant documents, and the rest irrelevant. And so the goal is uh, to find a weight matrix that uh, orders the relevant documents higher than the irrelevant documents. And of course, uh, since we have this huge matrix, the problems are we have a huge memory footprint and the capacity of the model. So we have to do something to avoid overtraining. And what we did is we used the rank boost approach. So uh, you all know wh what that is. It's, it's a, uh, a boosting approach to pairwise ranking. And the nice thing about it is you do a forward feature selection. So you select one feature at a time. So you this uh, avoids uh, the capacity problem and also the memory problem. The memory problem is mostly avoided by uh, bagging. So what we do is we, we, we uh, split the training set in, in different bags and train separate models and the models are then averaged. And the nice thing about the bagging, also the, the, the other nice thing is that the features that you learn on different splits of the training data are different. If you, uh, if you lump them all together, you always learn the same important features and you want to see a little bit of variation. Then uh, we have uh, a way of constructing this matrix on the fly, so we never have to store the full matrix in memory. And we only, well, all, all of those tricks, you, you know, I mean, you only update gradients in, in, uh, in boosting for those features that co-occur with the features that you just saw. Then uh, we also do uh, feature hashing, which normally doesn't improve results. It didn't improve results for us, but it makes it just a little bit more efficient again. Okay, so that was one approach. Then we had a second approach to do the same thing, where we just, uh, that the idea was to have a comparison, that's another student of mine, by using Vopal Webit which is uh, advertised as a, as a very efficient tool for large-scale learning. So it, uh, it does online learning instead of boosting. It doesn't do, uh, it uses L1 regularization. So basically you do backward feature selection by L1 regularization, not forward feature selection, but it's the same objective, pairwise ranking. And uh, they also have this trick of uh, the quadratic expansion that is not stored in memory, but on the done on the fly. 
And uh, what we also did in this model is, uh, which made our baseline, this was supposed to be the baseline, better than our, our approach. <laughs> So what we did is uh, we trained a sparse model like like before, where you have unigrams and bigrams, and then in a second step uh, we integrated the the score from the sparse model as dense feature in a next model that uh, addis in addition has this uh, domain uh, knowledge features on patents, like same inventor, same uh, patent company, same IPC class, and the combination of these uh, dense features, these domain knowledge features, and the word features, that was uh, the best you could do. That was really a very, very good model. So we could use these dense features in the other approach as well, but this... So it, it, it's, it's, it's not in this fancy quadratic expansion and, and, and feature selection and whatever. It's, it's all in, well, as very often in uh, empirical CL, it's all in the features, right? If you have to write features, then whatever machine learning tool you use. Well, anyway, so uh, some uh, experimental results. So for the patent CLIR experiments, we used Japanese English uh, data, so for translation from NTCLR. For ranking, we did this uh, automatic extraction of, uh, of relevant patents by uh, looking at the citations, and we had three relevance levels, so family patents, which is the same patent filed at another patent office, is most relevant. Examiner citations are more relevant than applicant citations, because applicants they mostly, uh, they are not really interested in citing a patent that already has the innovation in it that they actually want to publish. So it's, the examiners can be trusted more than the applicants. Yeah, and we used 100,000 queries for training. And yeah, you see the statistics. Okay, the performance uh, according to MAP and Press. Press is a, a recall-oriented metric that is mostly used in patent retrieval. So DT is the direct translation. It's slightly worse than uh, the PSQ. That's this uh, research approach where you do some query expansion. Then the boosting approach that only uses sparse features is not really that exciting. And Vopal Rabbit using dense and sparse features is the, the very best approach. Yeah? 32 map instead of 27. And uh, as you see, uh, this, this combination of dense and sparse features, there must be something behind it. And so we, we looked further into this and asked ourselves, uh, can we do more on rank aggregation? Because the idea would be if you have uh, different uh, sources of information like SMT information and ranking information and dense features and sparse features, what would be the best way to combine those? So and we tried uh, two different ways. So one is uh, to add them as features to the Vopal Rabbit model where you have uh, learn a weight for each of them or just a linear combination of each of the scores or border counts, that's the same, right? And uh, what we found is so if you uh, remember the results, so here 27 was the best uh, translation approach, direct translation or PSQ, also probabilistic structure queries, and Vopal Rabbit standalone was 32. So if we now combine uh, direct translation and PSQ either by border counts or by Vopal Rabbit, it basically stays the same, right? It was 27 before, and now it's 27 again. So uh, combina uh, combining two approaches that uh, carry the same information, like they're both translation models, that doesn't help very much. And, and here the same, if you combine boost, also the, the, the sparse, also the word-based model that we learned by boosting with the Vopal Rabbit model that combines sparse and dense features, we get up to 33 map, and we've before we were at 32.8. But if you combine now uh, orthogonal information, like the translation approaches and uh, the ranking approaches, then you get up to 37. 
and that's really big. I mean, uh, in, in information retrieval, it's it's like in, in well, I would say two two points in map is is big. Like in in machine translation, you have two blue points. One blue point, yeah, two. And uh, so, and then we get f five blue points. That is, it's it's really a big improvement. So, uh, but the the idea is to uh, orthogonal train orthogonal information systems and combine them. Then you get what you need. So, future work as uh, continuing on this line is so if you uh, maybe some of you know this paper by John Shaw Taylor, one of the. Uh, main guys in uh, machine learning. Uh, he, he, he wrote the first uh, support vector machines book, so it was called the support vector machine book. And he uh, had an approach uh, where he used kernel regression to learn phrase tables directly uh, without alignments. And that never worked. So he had, uh, there was, were some follow-up papers that they tried to use those phrase tables to initialize or to re-rank and, 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 never, and nothing really worked. But uh, we, we might try to use his approach for CLIR because our phrase tables are built in a very similar way the, the phrase tables that we use for ranking. They, are, they optimize a the ranking objective. They don't care about uh, word ordering, uh, there's no language model I involved, so it, it might be that this approach works very well for CLIR. And the same for a recent paper by uh, Phil Blansom and, um, and his students where he used neural word embeddings to do uh, machine translation, and that model also has the problem that uh, it, it, it doesn't really work very well yet for translation because using these representations you can uh, keep going, generating target strings forever, so nobody tells you that, uh, that you are uh, doing any worse in, in, in terms of uh, representing uh, the meaning in the target that you are supposed to uh, represent in, in the source. So that this, that this neural language model, uh, neural word embeddings, they are, they are really good for uh, as similarity metrics, as uh, meaning representations, but uh, so far they, they don't work very well for translation. And again, maybe they work uh, quite well for CLIR because uh, that's exactly what you need for CLIR. It, it's a problem of similarity. It's not a problem of uh, generating a string that uh, is fluent. And then I'm looking at uh, other grounding scenarios for SMT. Thank you very much.